As you can tell, I'm with Rick Weineke today. I'm in Texas. Rick is in Arad, Israel at his home. And uh, during this time of the these days leading up to Pentecost, there was a moment when I released a word, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I'm turning things uh, inside, upside down and inside out. And that's what he was describing as his new normal. And it uh, almost immediately, I received a response from Rick uh, to that. So I wanted to share, wanted him to share with us today uh, during this gathering, uh, why that phrase was so meaningful to him and how he sees it uh, for things coming in the days ahead. Rick? Okay. Um, when the phraseology was used, for me, obviously a lot of the things happening in and around Corona and everybody's lives have been um, dis disruptive for sure. But it's almost like you hear varying responses. People sometimes are hyper complaining about it. Other people are, it's taking them to a place where all of a sudden there's a deeper appreciation, say of family, or all of a sudden they have spare time, that they have a chance to think. And everybody, everybody has got their, their version on what it means and, and timesy stuff and everything else, which to a large degree, over the years, I've learned not to listen to too much because living in Israel, you get everybody's version of end times, everybody's version. And so far after about 40 years, every single version has like just done nose plants. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but when you said that into the whole thing of entering into your rest, then I'm going to turn everything upside down and inside out. All of a sudden I felt, I felt really struck with something that the Lord had shown us, shown me within creative processing as a, as a sculptor. I had worked on a lion years ago. And it was the first time within the motif of the lion was, the lion's quite large mm -hmm. and he's vertical and he's roaring upward and he's standing on 12 stones. And the 12 stones I kept getting from the Lord that this represents the 12 tribes of Israel and that the lion is in a position of intercession mm. and the roar is going upward and he's standing and he is the dominant figure on top of the 12 stones. But as I started to do the beginning sketches of this, I could feel myself being pulled into it, but it was the first time I had ever done any kind of symbolism touching Jewish suffering alongside the crucifixion of Jesus. And I saw somehow with the drawing, I saw it within the mane of the lion, within the weaving of the hair, I started to sketch in what would be sort of a surreal crucifixion scene, say. Okay. And to the side, one side of the crucifixion scene, it was multiple heads that would dissolve into the hair of the mane of the lion. And it represented Orthodox Jews, rabbis, but also very surreal so that you could see it and not see it. And they were holding Torah scrolls, each one, each one of the figures as he faded into the hair was holding Torah scrolls and he would disappear into the head of the lion. And it was like, in a way it represented, it spoke to me and said, ah, this is the expulsions. This were ah. all the multiple expulsions because the Torah scrolls was the last thing through European history, primarily with the Jews, was the last thing to be carried with them when they were expelled from different countries. And yeah. almost every European nation has a history and multiple times of expelling their Jewish community. And so that was one side of this crucifixion to the other side i did it began a drawing of a large 
opening of a crematorium and a chimney coming out. And out of the top of the chimney were six surrealistic figures, almost like smoke. And they interwove into the hair of the lion, came out of the menorah, and the mane that would go over the part of the mane of the lion that would cover the chest area, all were these surrealistic figures, very surreal, coming out almost like smoke, again, interweaving with the hair of the mane. And I kept looking at it, it was all intriguing, and I felt like the Lord was pulling me into this while I was doing the sketch, and I'm seeing these different things. And I'm thinking, wow, this is like somehow the crucifixion in the center between Jewish suffering of expulsions, but then the ultimate place of suffering and ultimate place of memory of suffering for the Jewish people, the Holocaust, and touching the number six million. But to the, then bouncing back to the other side of the mane of the lion, I started to see and started to sketch a menorah, but the menorah was upside down. And it was floating, but it was all a part of the background of the hair and within the lion, but obviously not, not in the way you would normally see a menorah. A menorah would be standing upright, and menorah has a very distinct symbol. Right to the Jewish people themselves, but in my mind, very strongly representational of the temple itself. And in a way, I started to ask the Lord, why upside down? And I kept on feeling this is a sign of the diaspora. When the Jewish people are out of the land, they're under judgment. And in a sense, the deepest place of judgment for them as the people is being taken out of the land. Right. So in a way, the coming back into the land in 1948 is a sign of the favor of God turned towards them. But it, all of a sudden it's stuck in my head that later on in different pieces, the idea of the menorah represents the presence of God. Right. For me, in a, a particular menorah that I did, the center candle of the menorah represents the Holy Spirit specifically. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the candle being upside down is going to be the diaspora. But now, in my mind, especially living in this land that is so pronounces the heart of the Father towards the Jewish people and bringing them back to the land, reestablishing them here. But alongside that reestablishment is the idea of the promise, the hope that they would understand his presence, mm -hmm. that it would be a revelation of God to them as a people, but as a nation back within their borders. And so, when you spoke this, entering into your rest, the immediate connection to the upside down was the sense of the menorah, the diaspora. But within this now thing that's happening internationally, it's almost like a prophetic sign to me that the upside down is now the, the menorah standing upright. Yes. Where for over 2,000 years yeah. it's been upside upside down and in a way alongside all the wordage that goes our new normal are all of these things right? right all of a sudden god is bringing this into a right alignment with the nation of israel because the menorah is upright and it really struck me because the last piece that i'm working on in poland now in auschwitz for the fountain of tears there it's called the vengeance of the lamb. It's a full life-size lion, fully in the round. Again, 12 stones upright, roaring, a sense of intercession, but it's more of a declaration of authority now. Yeah. And there's a lamb that is interwoven and it's a lamb that has been sacrificed. So the lamb is laying between the front legs of the lion. 
And the name of the piece is called The Vengeance of the Lamb. And in a way, the whole prophetic word connected to the fountain where the Lord was saying, I'm going to pay back what was taken from them, the Jewish people within the Holocaust. I'm going to bring into the kingdom six million for what was taken from them. This whole prophetic word that was really, in a sense, the birthing right. of, of what the fountain would later be. But the sense of the vengeance See, when God does vengeance, he takes the place that so represents death and mm. he brings life. Right. That's the Lord's That's vengeance. Just... In a sense, vengeance within English always has a sort of a, a violent connotation to it. But in a sense, his violence is to bring life. Right. And he touches it. So again, the sense of what was upside down, but we yes, perceive yes, as yes, normal, yes. is now right side up. That's the prophetic word that the Lord is declaring, in a sense, over Israel and over what he intends to do as a nation is to reveal his presence to them. In a sense, all this symbolically within the menorah. The other part was the sense of inside out inside out and the moment i heard that something really clicked with me because i thought to myself everything we carry of intimacy with the lord as believers to a large degree we carry it on the inside right and, and in a way we try we try to live our lives as believers be, be, before all the non-believers that we know. I, I am, and most, most of the believers that live here in Israel basically do not follow what Westerners would see as normal evangelical practice, where you're basically waiting every second for, you don't even wait, you just bust in verbally and you present them with, um, I don't want to sound really bad, but almost like a sales pitch in a way to try and convince them of something right. to do with you. Right. In Israel, in Israel, probably to the most part, we live our lives before them, waiting for them to ask the question, what is different about you? What, what exactly? And in a long way, it's like then they're willing to listen. Right. But what you were saying in the sense of this prophetic word over this time of the inside out, all of a sudden, what we've got that we carry on the inside primarily that is intimate between us and the Lord, within this time coming, all of a sudden, it's going to be pulled out of us. It's going to be revealed what we carry on the inside in, in such, such a, a revelation of the person of God before the nation that we're in, the family that we're a part of, the neighborhood that we're in, whatever area the Lord has woven us relationally and brought us into the, all of a sudden, all that that is inside of us is going to be brought from the inside and brought out. And it's going to be a revelation of that relationship that we have with him. All the intimacy of it and all the sense of things that we have maybe kept hidden. Yeah. And, and in a way, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe it wasn't the right time to... Right. To, you know, a deluge of personal experiences and everything else. But the Lord, I really feel strongly that the Lord is going to pull everything that has a relationship, has a connectedness to him yeah. that is on the inside. He's going to bring it out. You know, Rick, that's real. It's very similar to what Jesus said when he said to the people, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Now, his relationship, as far as they knew, he his relationship with the father was internal 
But when he says, you've seen me on the outside, right okay then that means what's inside has come to the outside right and there and, and you there's no uh uh one there's no two different lives two different people they're one and the same and you right. and, and uh and that's really what what i think we're supposed to do we're supposed to be that demonstration of what god looks like what god sounds like what god moves like and the things that he does so it's a real uh I think, like you're saying, these times are are provoking that, are bringing that out in the open. But I get the feeling, I get the feeling a lot of times we use the word it's what we're supposed to be. And so somehow when people hear that, sometimes it makes them feel guilty that, oh, maybe I'm not doing enough to be what I should be. Or on the other hand, I'm to be what I'm supposed to be can cause all kinds of question marks. But I get the feeling all of a sudden when the Lord pulls out of us who we are right. to him, right. it'll be as much of a shock to us yes. as it will be to them yes. because it'll be his initiation. It won't be us trying to read books to figure out who am I exactly and how am I going to communicate this and what can I do it, can I not do it? He's well, just going to do it. And it'll show what he values, not what we think he values. Exactly. Those two things are very different. See, religion is all, all about our own it, ideas. It has to be. It has to be that way. Because everything that's, yeah, everything that's upside down and inside out always becomes the thing that we didn't really know was there, but now it is there. And yeah. we realize that, oh, mercy, this thing's been upside down. It's been in a wrong position all this time. And all of a sudden we come in, everybody around us sees it, but we also have a deeper revelation of the heart of the Father. Now, Because for the Jewish people, it's a removing of the veil. See, so this, what you're seeing here, you're seeing the whole play, play uh, as you look at what's going on now. God yeah. is, is clearly setting the stage. Right. Okay. Regardless of how you want to think about it and your own ideas about, like you said, end days and all that kind of stuff, what God is doing is a real restoration. Right. It always begins with with Israel. Right. Always, always. has to has to. Has to. And and one and as it does, it also flows throughout the rest of creation. So right. you know we're. we're to, to talk about this new normal is not to talk about all the adjustments we're making to try to feel like we did in the old normal, you know, right. feel good about things. We're desperately, desperately trying to get back to what we thought was normal. Right. So we'll feel good again because we put it all back again. Yeah. This is, this is really the truth about stepping into things that uh, were we couldn't know until this point stepping into a world and a reality we didn't know really existed and now we're starting to step into the real thing that's really what rest is it's the real thing. yeah 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 no i totally agree and see it's it's us going through the sense of shock that all of a sudden we step into a place of intimacy almost by accident we step into I've always told people, it's like being in a large house and you're looking for something, you step into a room that is private, it's intimate, and you know you don't belong there, so yeah. you're trying to back out, but then all of a sudden you, you become aware that the Lord is saying, no, I have positioned you to come into this room. Right. You're supposed to be here. And then again, mm -hmm. it's like having to rediscover a level of who God is that we we didn't know existed and we didn't know the ability within us existed right. to be able to sense him to that kind of a level. No, it's great. It's totally great. So anyway, this is, let's, this this is this is a great way to see where God has brought us these last 50 days 
and the key point. This is really what you're describing for us is really the launch point. And that's what the Lord spoke to me last week. He said, you're, you're at a launch point. Okay. Right. He wasn't talking about me as an individual trying to launch something. He's not talking about a, a trying to create a ministry or something that's going to launch. Okay. Right. This is right. something he's launching. Right. Okay. And, uh, it's, it's very interesting this week for the first time. Uh, I think this week, the, uh, space program in the U S is launching someone into space in a way they have never done before. And so again, the Lord has left this thing. He's getting ready to do something and launch all of us into a whole, uh, uh call it stratosphere that, uh, um, up to this point, we haven't been, we have yet to know. Yeah. No, so thanks. Hey, listen, no. send those pictures so we can send everybody the pictures of the things, the uh, pieces of sculpture okay. that you did. Okay. All right. That's thanks. Good. All right, man.